Hello, everybody, and welcome to Inspire Me Forward, episode eight. Can you believe it? Eight episodes. This is awesome. We started this first thing in the new year and episodes eight so far. I would like to introduce our guest today is Sarah Barnes from Boulder, Colorado. And Sarah, I'll have you introduce yourself in a moment. But something I wanted to sort of catch first was it came up this week and Sarah and I, Sarah did her uh, preview for everybody. And we had a few other people do previews that for those that are coming. And I, something I realized in me was that leaps of faith, I think I thought I saw leaps of faith as one way. Leaps of faith, they're forward, they're a hop, they're like leapfrog. I remember talking <laughs> to somebody once about it and they were like leapfrog. And you coil up and you wait and then you leap again. And 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 realizing that, and it was just an epiphany for me, maybe not for everybody else, but it was just this epiphany that ah, leap, leaps of faith are just so individual. They're as individual as we are. And they involve movement or not movement or circular or it, they're all so different. They're all different sizes and shapes and uh, risks involved. Um, perception of risk involved so I find just that it's just that idea of leaps of faith being so much broader and so much so much more than maybe when we started when I started this it was just and now it's like the, they're op it's opening for me and my heart's opening to them and going oh yeah that's a leap of faith too somebody said once it was just uh, I think it was Kim Hallen one of our second uh, episode where it's really a, a leap of faith is just some a venture into the unknown i'm paraphrasing that but it really is a venture just into the unknown but maybe if we're here today maybe it's a venture into the known and just sitting tight so with that um sarah i'd love for you just to give us a short introduction to yourself before we dive into the the juicy stuff okay um well as you mentioned i live in boulder colorado i'm originally from the midwest um and then lived on the East Coast and moved around a lot and eventually ended up uh, here in Colorado. And um, my first career out of college was actually as a management consultant, but then I went to graduate school and got a PhD in history. And because of moving around so much, I was an adjunct professor most of the places that we lived um, and for most of my academic career, which lasted about 20 years. Um, and taught um, taught history and uh, did research on women's history and history of higher education. And then we ended up in Colorado and there were horses <laughs> around. One of the nice things about living in Boulder is that there's a lot of open space. And so driving my kids around, um, there were horses standing around in pastures and it really rekindled a childhood passion um, and I was finally in a place and a time in my life when I could actually have a horse of my own. My girls were old enough to be involved as well. And from there, it was kind of a slippery slope. Um, and before long, I was um, teaching riding as well as carrying on with my academic career and sort of woke up one day and decided, you know, i if I want to make the world a better place, I'm um, having more of an impact um, if the work I do with horses than as an academic. And so I decided to step back from um, my identity as a um, history professor and uh, sort of moved to the barn full time and um, spent many years as a riding instructor, um, sort of evolved um, there toward teaching riding as a meditative art. Um, and also developing a practice as a equine facilitated coach. And while I was in the midst of that, um, I was working with uh, Linda Kohanov and had a um, very sort of impactful experience at one of her workshops and started without really intending to, to write the book, uh, nonfiction, or I'm sorry, fiction, this time creative fiction, um, historical fiction. And um, now, I, although I still have horses in my life and do a little bit of teaching on the side, I am, I guess, on my third or fourth carnation, incarnation, if you count the 
the brief time as a management consultant, on my fourth incarnation as a writer and author. Nice, nice. Incarnation, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Incarnation. Yeah. We evolve as we go. Yeah, there you go. What do they say? You change careers five times at least in a lifetime. Okay, well, I've got one more coming. I guess, more to but... come after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And how interesting that just how you've moved and how, you know, been in suddenly open space and the horse is available and able to revisit that, that childhood. Lovely. Yeah. So... When we first spoke, you and I spoke about leaps of faith not always being giant leaps of faith, that mm -hmm. they can be small, a, a group of small ones. And and that really resonated with me because I've never felt in my life that I've taken a huge leap of faith, but I've had all these small places where I've gone into the unknown. So um, I love that we were we're bringing that forward. That I think there's people that probably resonate a lot with that. Is that there? It doesn't have life doesn't have to be one. It it can be. It absolutely can. It, it like I say in the beginning, it, individual leaps of faith are all different. So I love that we're bringing this one forward. So I'd love for you to just jump in and see where. You know, let us yeah. know what your leaps of faith have been. Well, and it, um. You know, looking back on that initial conversation and also the insights that you started today's conversation with, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out what is a leap, when I first heard the theme of your podcast and even listening to the first couple episodes and just what immediately comes to mind is that huge life change, like leaving a marriage, you know, leaving a job and moving across the country with no idea what's coming next, it, you know, those like crossing a chasm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I've never done that. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was married fairly young. I've been, you know, with the same uh, partner for 37 years, I think we're going on now. Wow. Um, and it, that, is such a solid relationship in my life that anything um, that comes along because that's so solid doesn't feel like it's this huge leap. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I, you know, as we're thinking about that phrase, maybe for me, the emphasis has more been on faith than the leap. Mm. <laughs> so the, the jumps are, you know, fairly small. Um, and, but there was a lot of faith involved. Um, and so um, as I think about my um, my husband and I and, and, and our journey together, we were married the week before I started graduate school. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to Northwestern where he was finishing up the University of Chicago. I was starting at Northwestern. My parents lived nearby. I thought we had at least the first five years of our marriage planned out because graduate school would last at least that long. David had job prospects in Chicago. You know, it all it all seemed tied up in this neat little bow, at least for the first five years. And within, I'd say, 18 months of of from when we got married that all got blown up, mm -hmm. um, mostly because of changes in his career, which then I was able to adapt to and, and stay in graduate school. And, and, but the time horizon shifted and we moved, we moved to the, back to the East coast of Boston where we'd met. And then that set up a pattern of moving every, really every about two years. Oh. Um, and we were in Boston and then we came back to Chicago and then we moved to Connecticut and then we moved to Milwaukee and actually that move from Connecticut to Milwaukee, I had a four week old. Mm. So I, I had, I had my first child in Connecticut and my, my pediatrician was like, you can't possibly as a new parent move with a, with a month old baby, but we did it, <laughs> lived in Milwaukee. Then we moved to Texas. Then we moved to Hong Kong. And then we finally, um, oh, and, and in, let's see, yeah, and in Texas, my second child was born. The year I finished, finally finished graduate school, um, I wasn't able to 
do the walk and get hooded and all that because I was nine months pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, and so had, had the second child along the way, then we all moved to Hong Kong and then finally we moved to Boulder and even, I don't generally mention this, but when I say we've lived in Boulder for over two decades, we actually had a brief foray back to Texas. Um, I thought we were leaving Boulder forever. And then we um, were able to come back to Boulder. It turned out that, that that move to Texas was a huge mistake for many reasons. Um, and we were fortunate enough to come back. And you know we've now been here um, without any more uh, moves out of state um, for over 15 years. But even once we moved to Boulder, we moved around different homes mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So there's been a lot of a lot of change in that way. And I guess each one of those moves was a small leap of faith. Um, but I think because we were moving as a family, um, they they didn't feel like a lot of faith had to be involved other than being open to change, being open mm -hmm. to, you know, a new, uh, a new city or a new country in the case of Hong Kong, um, new friends, um, new routines, a new home, but all those kinds of things kind of energized me and didn't, mm -hmm. didn't feel like, it, yes, it was the unknown, but because I had this, I was moving with my family, my, you know, my kid and that, provided having kids actually provides almost an automatic community when you move to a, a new setting. Yeah. Um, and I was very supportive of my husband's career, which was the cause for all this moving around. Um, and because um, I made a decision, it, it's sort of symbolic that I got married the week before graduate school, sort of where my priorities were. I'd made the decision that that as long as I was able to teach, um, I didn't necessarily have to be on the tenure track somewhere because mm -hmm. that would have that would have created a lot of um uh, of not tension necessarily, but there would it, it would have been more challenging to figure out you know, how to, how to make the marriage and the family work. So yeah. th that, um, I don't remember that being a particularly fraught decision. I sort of felt like, you know, to the extent that I could, it was, you know, I grew up in the eighties when we were supposed to have it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was my way of, of having it all. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there were those many small changes, but, um, no, no huge um, leap in into the unknown, but still requiring that faith that we could go out into the world and everything was going to be okay in this new mm -hmm. place. Yep. Um, and that kind of didn't happen when the second time that we moved to Texas. You know, we, mm. we we moved out. You know, moved to this new place, and my daughter was in middle school, which is a really hard time to have sure. a kid move. Yeah. Um, my younger daughter struggled some as well. I had horses to bring along at that point and trying to find, you know, yeah. a, a good situation from them for them was mm -hmm. actually harder than. So that, that kind of gave me pause. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my husband's, um, the, the, the job situation that he walked into turned out to not be at all what he was sort mm -hmm. of anticipating or been led to believe. So that was a tough one to to um to handle and was a big growth opportunity for, mm -hmm. for us as a family um and then we got a chance to come back to um to boulder which was sort of like this gift from heaven like i i never met because mm -hmm. we'd been so happy here and that we were actually then able to come back mm -hmm. um and it several years after then we moved around the homes um in the boulder area and downsized mm -hmm. at one point when my kids were both out of the house and so about 2015 or so i looked around and it my kids were both gone by that point uh, off to college 
Um, my husband probably had one more career choice, um, career change left. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know what? I don't want to move again. Mm. I don't want to leave Boulder at, at this point. I had a, my teaching business with the horses. I had a barn community. Um, I didn't have kids at home that would provide an automatic community for, for me somewhere new that we might move. I kind of lost my enthusiasm for taking those small leaps into yeah, absolutely. the unknown. And so I, I, Turned to my husband, I said, you know, if if you find that one last job somewhere else, you go. <laughs> you go. <laughs> I'll stay here. You can come back when you're finished, when you're ready to retire. Wow. Um, and he agreed. And um, so then we thought, okay, if this really is where we're going to stay, because he was equally happy with our life in Boulder, um, where do we actually want to be and so mm -hmm. when I when I gave the um that title and and the faith to stay as opposed mm -hmm. to the leaping mm -hmm. this, this was the real break in our pattern was how about if we stay somewhere instead of yeah instead of leaving instead of leaping um and so that's when we started looking around for, at that point we were, we had downsized to a smaller home and it was perfectly fine, but it, there was a, there were things that weren't perfectly fine about it, particularly for me um, in terms of actually having a place to work at home. Um, and I, it was sort of serendipitous and off in the future. I had no idea that, that I was going to have a career shift to become an author and a writer. Mm -hmm. um, but we started looking around for, for property that really felt like a place we could put down roots and found the place that we are now. And within a month of moving into this house that has this space, mm -hmm. um, which is my, my office, my study, within a month of that, I had that experience at Linda's where the book started. So it mm -hmm. was this, you know, putting, putting a, literally putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is my place. Mm. This is where I'm going to put down roots. This is the land that feels right, where I feel inspired, where I feel, um, you know, the first time I walked on our, on our property, I, I started crying. It just, like, <laughs> I, I just felt like I'd find that, that I'd finally really come home. Yeah. And then, you know, a month later, this, book downloaded into you know into my lap onto my laptop um wow. and and now I had you know now this is where you know what I'm doing where I am and yeah you will have to drag me out of here so that that that's wow. what I'm thinking about you know all those small little leaps but then the the really big thing was actually deciding to stay to stay yeah it yeah, you, Greta Matos that we talked to from Patagonia had moved around and they, we talked to, when I talked to her, we talked about it's when they, when you find that place, it's the pull in your heart that you find stops. Mm -hmm. And when you spoke of that, it's just, I wonder if that, that felt that pull to, to move and be okay with moving. And then that, that pull, when you found there and you just, that pull just settles out. Yep. Wow. That's powerful. I swear these things are for me. <laughs> oh, I needed to hear that today. <laughs> so I hope others do too. <laughs> wow. Um, and the idea of just knowing, I, I can we talk a bit more about that of just knowing? That, yeah. Uh, I, um, you know, it, I'm in this phase of my life now where I have time to rediscover those sort of that sort of intuitive connection with with that inner knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, definitely my relationship with horses has really deepened that. So that, you know, that that started sort of 
well, when I was a child, but when I reconnected, so, you know, sort of two decades mm. ago. Um, and I think it, it, that was an evolution too, into reconnecting my head with my body, my head with my heart mm -hmm. and, and then starting to, um, starting to pay attention to that inner knowing, yeah. um, and then have the confidence to, to actually, um, you know, to stay with it. And I probably, for many different reasons, but I, I probably would not have been in a place um, spiritually, emotionally um, to have that revelation. Like I can still remember mm. standing in my bathroom in that the previous house, looking at myself in the mirror going, I'm not going to move again. Mm. <laughs> at least not like I will move one more time to the place that I want to be. But um, and yeah, be, it, and it, it comes for me, it comes as a, you know, as a flash, as, as a, mm -hmm. just sort of this, um, non-rational, not irrational, but non-rational. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and you know, that, that this feels written in the same thing, walking on this property, you know, this feels right. Yeah. Yeah. And so and that's being able to trust that. And I think yeah, anyway, that just came with age. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we, as we get older, we sort of let go of some of that other and just and sit in, fall into that and go, yeah, I am going to listen and I am going to follow that. And like you're, you know, you said, you know, non-rational versus irrational. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful statement. Wow. And then your books. I'd love to talk. I think we've probably got a lot of listeners that have are in the process of writing or have the idea of writing books or maybe have have written. But what that leaps of faith in that process. Yeah. Um well I I I kind of have to back up a little bit to 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 really give the context for the mm -hmm. book. Um to my other big example of staying, the mm -hmm. faith to stay, which in, involves um, a horse. Mm -hmm. And um, her name is Oka Tio, uh, Tio for short. And I, uh, she came into my life in 2012, mm -hmm. um, following a long string of horses that, that had been Part of my life and I had been an inventor um competitive and um had goals um mm -hmm. as as an inventor and the horses that I had for either they had come with an undisclosed injury or they had developed physical issues and for one reason or another they couldn't meet the right. the goals that I had and I always found good homes for them and you know but I did move them along mm -hmm. and um and so this horse okatio i the the horse that i'd had previously had been drugged when i did, mm -hmm. did the um trial and it, 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 it without going into that story he had really kind of broken my heart so mm -hmm. i i um i i was so hopeful with tio i got her as an unstarted four-year-old you know, she's everything that, that I thought I wanted and everything was going wonderfully for the first six months that we were together. And then she had what I thought was a minor slip in the aisle mm -hmm. and within two months, she was completely unrideable. Oh dear. Um, and again, one of those the same, like that moment looking in the mirror, <laughs> this was a moment in the driveway sitting in my car having just come home from the barn and crying probably harder than I've ever cried in my life. And I was wow. so, I was so angry at the universe and so frustrated. And so, you know, with, why was, did this keep happening to me with these, these horses that I, you know, opened my heart to and um, loved and, and I just kept getting 
it, like it felt like this big no from the universe. Mm-hmm. Thought, Does this mean I'm not supposed to have horses in my life? And when I had that thought, this huge well of grief just wow. out of me. And and the the little left brain voice over here that's observing this huge storm of emotion goes, hmm, <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, I'm I'm not gonna accept that horses aren't supposed to be part of my life because then I, you know, that that's even worse. So what are my options? I said, mm-hmm. I can't, I, I was so bonded with this horse. Mm-hmm. I said, I, I can't give up on her. So I'm just going to have to surrender. And I don't know where this is going to take me, mm-hmm. what's going to happen. But I had to have the faith to stay with that horse. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. Um, and it really that was I I had been prepared um by the horses that I had and I was working with um a guy named James Shaw at that point who um teaches Tai Chi for equestrians and so I had I was in the process of changing a lot about the way I approached horses and um so I was I was I was prepared shall we say but that decision to stay with Tio really started me off on the spiritual path that I've been on Mm -hmm. ever since because I, I need, I didn't have any resources to, to know how to navigate the waters that Mm -hmm. she was bringing me into. Um, And I started meditating and I think I was reading Deepak Chopra and Oprah, you know, where do you start? (laughs) And, um, and one of the things was to pay attention to synchronicity. Yeah. And so not very long after that, I got in my, my dog is asking me to go up. And, anyway. <laughs> um, I got a um, friend request from Linda Kahana on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. which I don't really use, but I knew who Linda was because I'd read the Tao of Equus. Mm-hmm. Years before, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Linda Kahana wants to be my friend. <laughs> and that led me to... Um, her book, The Way of the Horse, which is a, there's a card deck and um, chapters that go along with each of those cards. And I think without that, the wisdom in those pages, I never would have made it through those, really those first couple of years with Tio and trying to figure out, you know, if she was ever going to be rideable again, how to get her sound, how to just the, the whole emotional roller coaster that those of us that, that, have horses Mm -hmm. to find ourselves on and um those i I, the card that i would pull constantly would was chiron which is the wounded healer you know what is the wisdom behind the wound yeah (laughs) and so it's like what what is is it her wound is it my wound is it our collective you know what what is the wisdom here there has to be there has to be something to learn here there has there has to be um something to positive to yeah. to come out of this experience um and so then it was another couple of years after that when i started attending clinics and mm-hmm. workshops with linda um and the the first one that i went to was um black horse wisdom which is very um, focused on intuition and creativity yeah. and it's wonderful. And I went back um, that same year um, to a to a writing workshop that she um, that she held, not because I had any great plans to be a writer. I thought maybe I'll jump start a blog. I don't know. Um, I really just went because um, I, I loved working with Linda and it was so nurturing for me in this journey that I was on with this horse. Yeah. Um, and, and so on the, it, and it, it, it was also very, the clinic was fo- focused on um, releasing intuition and connection to creativity. And on the third day, we'd done actually quite a bit of shamanic work, um, guided journeys and, and Linda's husband, um, Steve Roach is a mm-hmm. grand nominated um, musician and we were working with his soundtracks and 
And so by the end of that day, it, all of us, all the clinic participants were sort of in this altered state. Um, uh, and she, Linda said, now just go out on the property and sit down and write whatever comes to you. And it, um, you can stay as long as you want. Um, she was, she turned the horses uh, out to wander around. She said, we won't reconvene until the morning and um, just bring whatever you, you have and, and we'll share it. And so I sat down at a picnic table, opened my laptop, poised my fingers over the keyboard and just started writing. And really it was like this download, like this, this story just started flowing out of me about a, a girl and in, in dressed in animal skins on what looked like the steps of Eurasia and a horse and, and this, mm. this story started to evolve. So I, I kept writing and this huge super moon came up behind the Santa oh, wow. Maria mountains. And, you know, I went back to where I was staying, kept writing, kept writing in the morning. I had, I had the whole first chapter and I <laughs> read it to the clinic participants and Linda, Linda cried, which is always a good sign. Um, she said, this is, a, this is a book. You have to, you have to write this book. Yeah. And it's the story of the first person to ride a horse. Mm. Um, and so it's set, it's called She Who Rides Horses. Mm -hmm. And it's set on the um, steps of what's now Southern Russia in um, 4,000 BC. Um, and it's not really my story. I'm, I am the storyteller, yeah. but it's very much this experience of the story coming through me. Um, sure, and I, yeah. I had read, um, Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic, and mm -hmm. she, she describes a, a experience that she had that led her to believe that these ideas are it's out true. there in totally. the universe yeah. waiting to be manifested. Yep. And for me, the the first maybe six months of writing the book I would sit down and be like well I wonder what's going to happen today yep. and details would go in that um I wouldn't know the purpose until sort of three chapters later and then be like oh that's why that was important um eventually I did step back and do the research um because mm -hmm. I'm a historian after all um <laughs> And even there, it was amazing how some of the details that had gone into the story, particularly about the landscape, because my mm. sort of initial perception of the steppe was <clears throat> more like Mongolia or Kazakhstan. Okay. And actually, the steppe in southern Russia, where horses were first domesticated, um, there, there are lots of rivers, actually, and there okay. are river valleys and there are ravines and... Um, and in that first chapter, one of the primary scenes takes place in this ravine. Well, how did I know that there there were ravines there? Yeah. <laughs> but that out there are. Um, so there were, you know, details wow. like that that um, you know, I can't explain other than that it's like I said, it's not my story. Mm -hmm. Um so the 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 first book um uh, came out last year and I'm it's a um right now it's a trilogy although okay the story has a mind of its own it may go on even longer but I'm I'm um close to um the um sort of last edit of the second book mm -hmm. and um and then there'll there'll definitely be a, at least a third one after that for sure uh, and you know in speaking about a writing process, um, I have to say, I feel very fortunate to be in this situation where this, this I've been gifted with this story mm -hmm. um, because I can trust, and maybe this is a leap of faith too. Oh, I, I feel like I can trust the story. Like yeah. if I don't, it, I don't, I have a responsibility. I, I actually feel a tremendous responsibility to get the story out into the world because mm -hmm. I do feel like, and I'm trying to make it as historically accurate as possible. We, you know, horses have been with us for millennia. Yeah. And really the domestication of the horse, which wasn't a one-time event, it was really a process, mm -hmm. but um, changed the course of human civilization of more than just about 
you know, anything. And, and if you, um, it, 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 the way we perceive time and space, not to mention, well, don't get me started, but <laughs> um, we had a choice mm -hmm. as, a, as a species um, 6,000 years ago for what this relationship was going to be like. And um, mm -hmm. not coincidentally, when horses was domest were domesticated was also the point in time and space when, um, for lack of a, a better term, the patriarchy emerged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and horses and humans have lived with that confluence for the mm. last 6,000 years. For and, sure. and the imbalance that emerged between the masculine and feminine principles in all of us mm -hmm. or, and horses so profoundly demonstrate what a true balance of those qualities looks like I feel like we're at another choice point mm -hmm. things like your podcast mm -hmm. my book Linda's work um, it worked that people like work Schiller and mm -hmm. Rashid, you know, all, all these wonderful horse people. And then in all sorts of other realms of life, mm -hmm. um, a, a shift in consciousness is happening. Yep. The horses have been with us the whole time. They have the chance to, to, to guide us in that shift. Yeah. So, you know, I'm looking back to when that relationship started as as part of understanding um where oh, the yeah. horses will lead us now yeah yeah interesting so it's so much i would I, I, it feels like how you're saying this it's just so much it just it it's so much more than you ever like it just it oh. grows and grows and yeah. for you and and it's amazing that what it's brought what's come out yeah. I have to interject here I've heard recently heard that they're studying now when men or humans first got on horses they're not studying the horses they're now studying the humans and their seat bones and yeah. <laughs> but well that's a very clever way of you know yeah. thinking yeah, of from, from an osteological and all some of that research um that study in science and then another one came out in the fall of 2021 in nature mm -hmm. um pinpointing where and when horses all all of even that very recent research mm -hmm. still feeds right into into my story so like no oh, lovely yeah. yeah we will be sure to put up a link um, <laughs> in our summary for sure um so and I love that you brought Elizabeth Gilbert's up there. I love the her her concept of the that there are ideas out there, and sometimes you got to grab them or you know stop oh, them from going out of your else. head. And, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I've pulled over many a time. Um, I guess sort of going on both sides is as what did it? What were some of your fears in any leaps that you had? What were some of the what were some of your fears that that maybe came up for you that people could maybe sort of, you know relate or have some resonance with? And then um, on the flip side, what did it feel like when you did make those decisions? Yeah, um, you know, I I have to say that um, that it, as I'm thinking through this. Where I get myself in trouble mm -hmm. is when I don't trust enough in whether you want to call it the universe, mm -hmm. God, spirit. Um, and so the the fear is mm -hmm. that if I don't make something happen, it won't happen. Yeah. A very fine line at least for me between manifesting something mm -hmm. and making it happen mm -hmm. and so 
Um, where I get into trouble with fear is kind of around control and, okay. and making, and making things happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that it, when I come down on the side of fear as opposed to trust, and therefore I need to act and I, yeah. I need to, and maybe this is the, that sort of counterintuitive um, understanding of a leap <laughs> you mm. know, where I, I have to leap or, or it won't happen. Yeah. Um, that's usually where I get myself in trouble. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So when, when I let fear of, um, you know, whether it's, you know, fear, fear that, that something that I really want and desire, you know, that heart's desire, mm -hmm. feeling like I need to make it happen or otherwise yeah. it won't. Mm -hmm. uh, which is not to say, you know, that I'm advocating just sitting back and being passive because I, I also firmly believe in the power of manifesting. Sure. Um, but that requires, yeah, trust, an element of trust as well. For sure. And that, you know, when you say that, I go back to Elizabeth Gilbert, but her eat, pray, love and the, the scene where she's lying on the bathroom floor crying and just saying, God, what do I do? And you think, just go back to bed. And I, that's that. Just sit yeah. tight. You know, the, the sort of thought when you're talking about just staying and sometimes that just, just, just go back to bed. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So what about the other side? When, when you have taken those leaps, when you did, you know, decide, okay, I'm going to write this book or when you did go publish, you know, what, how did that feel? Um, amazing. Like, uh, humbling. Oh, really? As well. Okay. Yeah. Just, um, uh, yeah, I think that, that humbling feeling humble when confronted with the the power of again the universe spirit to act through me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and and you know and and what's possible that that I couldn't even have imagined Mm, like, good point. Yeah. You know, okay. I, who 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 could have imagined that you know this? Like, I'd have a book with my name. I know. <laughs> who could imagine okay. that. Yeah. Um, you know, who could imagine that? You know, I could end up in this space. Um, my my most recent learning around this making things happen versus manifesting mm -hmm. has to do with um, bringing another horse into my life mm -hmm. as uh, my, my mare Tio, I lost um, two mm -hmm. years ago to, a, I'm going to go let this dog okay, out. Absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Dog's got to go out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I lost Tio two years ago um, it, to a complications following colic surgery, mm -hmm. um, and she um, she died in my arms. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, one of those just heartbreaking moments. Mm -hmm. And I was quite sure I I, I had a, 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 a I had two horses at that point. Um, so I was left with, with my, my mare Prada and I swore I was never going to, I wasn't getting another horse, you know, I'm getting up there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I just, that I, I wasn't, that was not in my plan. Um, <laughs> and, but then, um, Prada became increasingly unrideable. Um, mm. she had an accident as a two-year-old. And so here I am on this same, um, treadmill, <laughs> um, 
having learned a lot, um, but then she probably had all sorts of lessons to to teach me too. <laughs> but at one point last about a year ago, um, I was was in one of those despairing moments and when things weren't going very well with her and 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 I have um through all my experiences with Linda and I I fully recognize the possibilities around being with horses that don't involve riding Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's so much that rich experience that you can have with horses without riding but I did come to the realization that for me personally Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the riding is actually a huge part of what feeds my soul Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and and that sort of sitting with that and going and, and accepting it and going I can't you know this 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 is a truth and I wrote mm-hmm. a whole book on it called She Who Rides Horses. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, There's it, a tie it, there. <laughs> and and yeah, so for me personally, that is mm-hmm. a big that is a big thing. So I was sort of in this ready to fall into this pit of grief because I wasn't going to give up on Prada, and but I couldn't ride her, and so you know, was was this something I you know this thing that was so important to me and being able to ride was I going to have to let it go my husband's sitting on the couch next to me he looks at me and goes just get another horse (laughs) it seems so simple (laughs) he's violently allergic to horses and like oh no (laughs) get it but he gets me and I'm like oh I I I actually could get another horse (laughs) um and so then I started trying to make it happen Ah, uh, there you go. And it, like in a frenzy, uh, yeah. um, and got three very hard nose from the universe. One of which involved having to actually put a horse down that mm-hmm. had a catastrophic injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this last year has been a lot about okay, yes, I can have another horse, but do I have the faith and the pain to just stay <laughs> and let mm. that horse come and trust yeah. that horse come into my life? Um, do you find when you do that, it happens, it does have, like it suddenly is like, oh, there it is. Yeah, within a, literally within a week of when I said, okay, I'm going to stop trying to make this happen. Yeah. If it happens, it happens. It took me about nine months to get in, like I said, three hard notes. Yeah. Get to that place. And literally within a week, and, and the, the story isn't quite finished on this one yet because the the, the who I think is going to be the new horse I haven't actually met yet. That's coming up next next month. But mm-hmm. literally within a week of surrendering and saying, okay, I've put every I've met I've done what I need to do to manifest. Like I put it out there to the universe there, you know, sure. but I'm not trying to make it happen. Um, my, my friend in Portugal came back and said, I think I, I think I found the perfect horse for you. Wow. (laughs) And for for your, for your, for listeners today, you know, this doesn't just apply to horses. This applies to so much. Of course. Yeah when you know I I I had like what's non-negotiable I had I had to recognize you know from the time that I was tiny actually riding horses you know there's there's something about the the physicality and the the meditation and movement and Mm -hmm. yeah that it was it it was it's part of who I am on a soul deep level yeah you know, and part of why, why I can, you know, sometimes I feel like I, why this book comes to me is because it's like, it's a past life. Mm, so, yeah. so that, that, that I had to like, accept that and not, not fight against it. Mm-hmm. And then, then what do I do with that? Okay. Well, yeah, maybe I could get another horse. And then what do I do with that? Yeah. yeah. Here home to, I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. 
Do you find that your that idea of like manifesting versus making? Do you find that as life goes on, you get a little better at recognizing it and a little better at at going? Wait a minute, I'm I'm making. Okay, I got to pull back, do that surrender. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, it's humbling oh, from um, some, I was actually at an, another workshop at Linda's a year ago um, in April when I was starting this search. And one of the other participants um, just very politely said, are, are you sure you're not like trying to make this happen? <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> you know, but part of me, yeah again that 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 little voice going okay yeah you can go ahead and do this but you you are trying to make this happen yeah yeah they called it (laughs) i i i just was ignoring it you know whereas whereas previously i might not even have heard that voice going you're trying too hard I, Mm. i wouldn't even have heard that yeah um this I I was very aware that I was for sure yeah the awareness of it well and, yeah. and it doesn't doesn't mean I didn't I still got the last <laughs> but this all goes it. everything you're saying goes back to what you said at the beginning of that faith mm-hmm. it just did every it, it, what I'm here like my heart is hearing is just faith have the faith yeah so rather rather than focusing on the leap part of the leap of faith it's work on the right. faith part of it yeah oh that's the faith part <laughs> i'm blowing um so as we have just cognizant of time here um i'd asked if you might have three pieces of wisdom so you have a lot of wisdom and, and i've written three pages here of notes so uh with so much wisdom but if you could sort of bring this into say three p- points of wisdom for our listeners to sort of take away well, and I'm, you may have to help me summarize too, because I think I, I did not um, plan those out ahead of time. I'm going to, sure, whatever comes to what you we've talked about. Yeah. So I, I, I think the number one thing is um, to recognize that, that you, in any situation, mm-hmm. you have a choice between trust and fear mm-hmm. and that if you can choose trust um you will have a better outcome i think mm. you know yep. so choosing choosing trust over fear um mat choosing manifesting over making it happen yeah um and then um I think li- the the foundation for those two things, being able to make those choices, um, comes down to listening, knowing yourself, and listening to you know what what really is um, important to who I am on a soul deep level, and and cultivating the ability to listen. Mm-hmm. because that that's the voice that will help you make those choices between trust and fear and between manifesting and making things happen exactly yeah so I've just written it down uh so if we had and i think those are sort of tie into this one but if we had if you had a call for action for anybody listening for myself and our other our, our pat that's here with us today if you had a call to action, so something that I could do today, like what would be that? What would be something or in the near future, what would be that call to action? Hmm. I think to um, practice practice faith. And that, um, you know, that, that can apply, that sounds sort of amorphous, but that can apply to how you decide you're going to show up each day 
um, each interaction you have with the people in your life, whether that's your family, you know, people you see at the mm -hmm. store, at the post office. Um, yeah, pr practicing having that um, that faith mm -hmm. in um, in in trust and manifesting and listening to your own intuition, all that, you know, it all comes down to having faith. Yeah. I almost feel here that if we practice that faith, the, the leap part, dare I say not easier, but it's, it, it's not as heavy. Yeah. It's not what I can think of. It's like if yeah. I if I have that faith, automatically am I really leaping? Yeah. Because you know, to take and I go back to your beginning to take to go to Hong Kong with two little ones, that I see that is like, whoa, that's a big step. Yeah. And, and it, you had that faith and you had that yeah, support system. It, yeah, because it didn't, you know, looking, it didn't even at the time, it didn't seem like that big I mean it was obviously a big move mm -hmm. but um yeah it it didn't it didn't seem like it seemed just like the next step yeah yeah wow thank you thank you for all that wisdom for that that faith that in, in feeding us all some <laughs> faith today that in whatever way that looks, but and that that surrender, I, I feel like I've been nourished. Oh, and the, that you've nourished us all with just a little little more of that that we all need. And going, oh, okay, let's, okay, yeah, I can take that next step. And so, thank you for that. That's my well, heart. Thank thanks you. Thank you, Linda, that's, for uh, letting me. Amazing. Um share my story and um you know one of my favorite lines from david white is um to become human is um to be human is to become visible mm. while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others oh, wow. so um you've you've given me a, a chance to um be visible um and and be a little vulnerable um but hopefully Sharing the whatever gift it is that I have to bring into the world. Mm -hmm. Well, you're inspiring it forward, and that's uh, pay it forward with the with the concept of inspiring, and that um, that we will certainly include that quote. That's beautiful. And with that, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, our next, we have three coming up in May, um, just because the Tuesdays worked well that way. So we are going to do three, and our next one is with the lovely Taylor Beckett and she is going to share another perspective that a leap of faith can come from us or come come from within us so again that leaps of faith are as individual as we are and she's going to bring another another concept and another way that it comes bubbles up in us and and pushes us to take that leap so thank you all i will put up a summary for for what we spoke of today and all of your, uh, the link to your book and some of the quotes and all of that. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank all right. you all for being here and sharing in another. I hope you were inspired to have faith and surrender and manifest. Don't make it happen. <laughs> thank you all. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. You say what?